So our next speaker is another friend, Carl Hart, professor of psychiatry and psychology at Columbia University, where his research includes path-breaking studies of methamphetamine and other drugs. He's the co-author of the widely used textbook called Drugs, Society, and Human Behavior, and is completing work on an autobiographical book that will certainly hit the bestsellers list next year. Carl is also, on a personal level, a generous resource of information about almost every drug I can think of, and a board member of the Drug Policy Alliance. So, Carl Hart. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you very much. Um, like most of us, we all have a charge from Ethan. And Ethan's charge was, do this in 15 minutes. To me, it was, do this in 15 minutes. Um, increase the intellectual tone of the discussion. Um, and oh yeah, knock it out of the park. Uh, so just wanna, one comment on, on, on Julie's um, presentation. Julie said that it's important for you all to come out of the closet, basically, and say that you use marijuana. That shit's easy. <laughs> say that you use other things as well. And don't even do it, don't just do it here. You have to do it outside of this sort of warm environment. You have to do it in places where uh, people are not friendly. Because doing it here, that's nothing. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about methamphetamine. Uh, before starting, I, I just wanna thank the funders for my research, um, Open Society Foundation and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I bet you all didn't think that you hear those two words mentioned together. Um, back in 05, I received a phone call uh, from the White House's Office of National Drug Control Policy and they asked me to participate in an anti-drug media campaign sort of a program, Roundtable. Um, the Roundtable was a briefing for writers, and the writers wanted to uh, have a better understanding of what methamphetamine does so they could infuse this information into programs, into television programs, into movies, into articles that they were writing. On the panel was an adult-dependent person, someone addicted on methamphetamine, uh, adolescent person who was addicted, uh, assistant U.S. attorney, and underco undercover narcotics agent, and myself. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. Just hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang um, on. So I proceeded to kind of review the literature. My job was to re review the, the scientific literature about the effects of methamphetamine. I basically con concluded that uh, the effects of uh, low doses methamphetamine produce little effects on humans, on their per cognitive performance and so forth. Doses less than 10 milligrams. Now, in doing so, my fellow panelists were horrified um, because they had an agenda and their agenda was, as you can see, um, uh, to uh, use this issue to enhance their popularity, and they did. Um, uh, the adult addicted person appeared on Oprah uh, had, was interviewed in, in Glamour, uh, the U.S. Uh, attorney, she's now a judge, and the narcotic agent has appeared on television shows and he's uh, a consultant to movies. Now, they, there are, were a number of claims that were made by their narcotics agent. By the way, I understand we have leaps here, the cops are here. That's a great thing. Um, hang, hang on, hang on, hang, 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 hang on. Um, I, we, we applaud them, I mean, that's, that's cool, but quite frankly, I, I would much prefer to applaud the, the sex workers who are here. Uh, uh, so there were, um, there were some claims that were made that I just want to kind of deal with here. Uh, the, the, our, the narcotics agent said that uh, tasers were ineffective weapons for uh, stopping methamphetamine users and you needed a more intense weapon. That was one, one claim. And he also claimed that methamphetamine was like no other drug. The addictive potential was something like we never seen before. Um, they were, it was creating meth monsters, as he, he said. Uh, and also there was a claim about the profound cognitive impairments that uh, would be seen with methamphetamine users, and this was leading to incredible behaviors. 
he described an anecdote in which a parent had apparently cut the head off of their child and was walking down the street and threw it at a police officer. Of course, I, I tried to follow up to find out about the veracity of this claim. I checked the newspapers and so forth, but um, that was, uh, I, that I was unsuccessful. But these were the claims made. Now, the claim that, the claim that uh, methamphetamine users uh, require a more intense weapon was reminiscent to me of a 1914 article published about the Negro cocaine fiend, in which the author claimed that uh, you could not stop black people uh, who were on cocaine with the regular 32 caliber bullets. You needed to increase the caliber of weapon, and indeed, southern police uh, forces moved from the 32 caliber to the 38 caliber bullet, and we think that this was an important sort of uh, uh, anecdote to, for that to happen. So that was one of the claims that, that concerned me. The other claim was that methamphetamine um, has a unique pharmacological profile, like it was like no drug that we had ever seen. So I did a study because I thought, well, maybe, maybe there is something to the hysteria. So maybe there's something um, that uh, is real about the hysteria. So my question was, does methamphetamine produce this unique pharmacological profile? If you look at here, this is a study that we just published, or is it forthcoming in addiction, and this is deamphetamine, methamphetamine, 12 milligrams here. This is 50 milligrams um, and deamphetamine and 50 milligrams methamphetamine, and this is systolic blood pressure. Uh, what you see here is that both drugs produce the same effect. By the way, deamphetamine is the active component in Adderall, okay? Now, this is a, another dependent measure. This is ratings of high. You can see that both drugs, uh, deamphetamine, methamphetamine, deamphetamine, methamphetamine, produce the same effect. And we also gave the participants an opportunity to choose uh, the drug, drug of choice or the drug that they would like versus some fi a $5 sort of alternative uh, reinforcer. What you find is that like deamphetamine, methamphetamine is selected on about the same amount of time. The bottom line here is that deamphetamine and methamphetamine are the same drug. Make no mistake about it, they are the same drug. This isn't new, other people have also published this. All right, still, there must be something in the, in the hysteria that reflects reality. So one of the things that I wanted to test then, what if we gave large intranasal doses of methamphetamine and checked out the cognitive performance of dependent people, people who were addicted? What would you find? Well, I reviewed the literature, and this is a list of papers. As you can see, there is a growing number of papers that has looked at methamphetamine's effects in a wide range of cognitive domains. Learning and memory, attention, sustained, sustained attention, vigilance, a wide range of sort of effects. What you find is that methamphetamine improves performance in these domains. Yet, still, there must be something in the hysteria that reflects something about reality. So another question I wanted to know, what happens if you look at brain imaging findings? Are the brains of long-term methamphetamine users different from the brains of controls? Again, we looked at the literature, and what we found from PET imaging, for example, this is just one type of imaging study. What we found is that you get, you can, when you compare methamphetamine users to controls, there is a decrease ranging from about 10 I shouldn't say a decrease, I should say there is, uh, there is a difference, a lower binding of dopamine transporters in methamphetamine users compared to controls, about 10 to 20 percent difference. And these are the studies that have found the difference. And this one study found an increase. So these are, this is what the evidence is, about 10 to 20 percent difference. So, when we think about this difference, we have to think about them in the context of potential caveats or the caveats. And one of the caveats that's important is that this difference may have predated methamphetamine use, that's one. Another potential caveat is that drug use other than methamphetamine is not controlled in these studies, nor is comorbid psychiatric disorders in these studies. 
Another thing that one must think about is the normal human variability in which when we look at the differences between binding of dopamine transporters, for example. If we take you all in this room, this side of the room compared to that side of the room, what we might find is that we might see 5, 10, 15 percent difference in binding between this side of the room and that side of the room. The question is, what does it mean? What are the implications? In this case, since we're talking about the brain, the brain is very important for cognitive functioning, what does it mean for cognitive functioning? All right, and so I was interested in that question. But before you can determine cognitive impairment or even cognitive normal functioning, the performance must be compared to a normative score taking into account the individual's age and education. Before you do, before you make any comparison, you have to make sure that the people who you are comparing are the same in terms of their age and their education. What has happened in the literature? The literature is replete with studies that have compared high school graduates, methamphetamine users, against college graduates, controls. If you do that, who's going to outperform who? The college graduates will outperform the high school graduates, unless, of course, you went to one of those for-profit colleges, right? <laughs> so, when I looked at the literature, only one study found that a minority of methamphetamine users were, were impaired when you take this important constraint into consideration. Only one study found that a minority of methamphetamine users were impaired. Seven of the 27 study methamphetamine users were impaired compared to two of the 18 controls that were studied. These findings, these minor, these limited findings have yet to be replicated. Despite the fact that you all, and me too, have been told these incredible stories about impairments in methamphetamine users. Only one study has found any impairment, and the impairment is in a minority of methamphetamine users. So, summary of the uh, empirical findings. When we give methamphetamine in the lab acutely, it improves cognitive performance. Now, when you look at some of the brain imaging studies, we have noted some differences. But these differences may be within the normal range of human variability. And the notion that methamphetamine users are impaired is simply not supported by the weight of the scientific evidence. Now, this is not, I should tell you, my goal is not to minimize real problems seen with methamphetamine abuse, because there are real problems. One of the main problems is that people do not sleep when they're taking methamphetamine. Now, if you don't sleep and you're not taking methamphetamine, you will have problems. Sleep is one of the most important human functions. So that is real, very real. I don't want to minimize that, but what I do want to highlight is that many of us researchers, we find what we look for. So and when we think about the lost key analogy, we look under the spotlight because that's where the, that's where the light is shining and we find typically what we're looking for. We researchers are looking for pathology, disease, illness, and that's what we find for. We're not looking for beneficial effects. And so you must understand, when you read the literature, you are not going to obtain a comprehensive understanding of methamphetamine's effects. That's not our goal. So if you understand that when you're interpreting the literature, we are increasing the intellectual tone of our discussion. <laughs> so, take home message. The clinical picture is not as bleak as the anecdotal reports would suggest. Now, when we think about anecdotal reports, I encourage, I beg you to discard 
belief systems with no foundation in evidence. When I hear people talking about how awful methamphetamine is, it makes me cringe because it's simply not true. Somebody just said, what about the 10 hour horny problem? And that person just said, it, uh, it's only a problem if you can't get it up. But let me, let me seriously address this 10 hour horny problem. Hang on, let me address the 10 hour horny problem. Now, one of the things that methamphetamine does, it's really good at vasoconstriction. That means it decreases the blood flow. If you want to get an erection, one of the things you need is vasodilation. So this notion that people are having sex for all these hours because that certainly, initially, you certainly can have an erection and you can perform longer and so forth. But ultimately, you're going to have this vasoconstriction problem. So is, I hope that's clear, all right? Now, I understand that science has solved few problems. I understand that. And so we must act. And when I say act, I mean treatment, education, policy, when our scientific knowledge is incomplete. That's a fact. Any responsible society should do that. And we should do precisely that. But we must also be cognizant of the fact that our knowledge is incomplete. And being cognizant of this will make sure that we are prepared to alter our actions when new and more complete information becomes available and dictates. We failed to do this with crack cocaine. We've known for many years, since the early 90s, that crack cocaine and powder cocaine were the same drug. But it wasn't until August 2010 that we had some relief in that awful policy that punished crack a hundred times more harshly than powder cocaine. And the relief that we got is still not the solution, but it is some relief. Finally, I'd like to leave you with this note. Use common sense. If some people or somebody is saying some incredible story about drugs and it seems outrageous, it probably is. That's quite simple. And this is a copy of the paper that reviews everything that I just said, it is published in Neuropsychopharmacology, and thank you all for your time.